morning, Uptown Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, it's a beautiful sunny day here in Chicago on a Sunday. And um, this morning, Cecilia is going to open us with uh, a scripture verse as we open the service today. Um, so, um, chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our God, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Thank you, Cecilia. That was in Revelations uh, chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Um, we're here this morning to worship the Lord, to be together, even though, again, I know we're just online and we're making comments to each other, and it's still this sort of ambiguous world we live in um, of online gathering. But I want to encourage you to um, say your amens in the comments, um, welcome each other, be as interactive as possible um, this morning as we worship the Lord together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We praise you and we know that you are the God that sits on the throne, that all things come together because of you. And Lord, we are here because of you. And we thank you, God, that you've made this day that we are in. We thank you that every day is a beautiful day to live. Lord Jesus, serving you, uh, serving each other, loving our neighbors, loving each other. Father, I pray that you would be glorified in this service today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Uptown Church. Would you join us as we begin uh, this Father's Day in worshiping the Lord together? Uh, we're going to sing some songs that are maybe a little bit older, uh, so hopefully you know them. Uh, the words will be on the screen, but let's uh, put ourselves into a posture of worship and an attitude of prayer, and let's sing together.
brokenness. Brokenness, brokenness is what I long for. Brokenness is what I need. Brokenness, brokenness is what you want from me. Take my heart. Take my heart. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. To yours, to yours, O oh Lord. To Something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you.
will bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things have me you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made you. And it's all about you. It's all about you,
Lord, we exalt you this morning. We give you praise and we give you glory even in the midst of such difficult and trying times. Our hearts are broken in so many areas and in so many ways. Lord, we think of so many shot and uh, wounded and killed here in Chicago this weekend. We think of Minneapolis. We think of uh, Buff uh, Syracuse, New York. Lord, our hearts are breaking in so many different ways. But Lord, we still exalt you. And we ask you to keep our hearts in the right place, uh, centered on you, worshiping you, glorifying you. May the deep parts of us, deep within, where you look, where you pay attention to, be inclined to you and to your voice and to your face. And we pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, once again, we would love for this service to be interactive uh, with the entire church family, engaging in the comment section, using the emoji buttons, things along those lines. Uh, this morning, we want to say Happy Father's Day. Uh, we want to take time to celebrate and honor all of the fathers that are out there, that are watching, that are part of the Uptown Church family. We say thank you, dads. Thank you for all that you do to pour into the lives of children. Uh, your families, the life of this church. Uh, we just want to thank you this morning, and we want to recognize you uh, for who you are and what you do. Uh, I, I want to really encourage all of the men this morning, not just uh, biological dads, because you don't have to be a biological father to be a father figure. Uh, I want to encourage all of us men to shine brightly with our mentorship, our love, and our sacrifice. Uh, we need you. Uh, the world needs you. This community needs you. Uh, we need to see uh, your life, uh, your godly life on full display, uh, not a shell of it that's half hidden or uh, sort of quiet, Lord, we, but we actually need it to be uh, out there open for everyone to see, uh, to be humble examples of compassion, vulnerability, strength, and faithfulness. Uh, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to always know the way. You don't have to always know how to fix things. But as Joshua writes and says, be strong and courageous, the Lord is with you, and the Lord is with you men. Uh, in the midst of honoring and celebrating fathers today, uh, I also want to recognize and name that this day can bring up a variety of pains. Uh, there are those among us who have never known their father, those who were abandoned by their fathers, or their father has died. There are those who feel dismissed and devalued because they uh, can't have kids, choose not to have kids, or are single. For some uh, with us today, Father's Day doesn't bring up joyous memories. It actually brings up memories of addiction, violence, abuse, and suffering. So I am here to say that I stand with you and that our church wants to wrap uh, its arms around you. Uh, we are praying for strength and healing for all today uh, on this Father's Day. The good news is that the Bible describes God as our Father. Uh, the good news is that the Bible shares that we are adopted by this father into his family. So may all of us this morning sense and experience our Heavenly Father's love, forgiveness, and acceptance. Uh, and to all men that are here watching uh, and participating in this service, young, old, married, single, divorced, widower, uh, once again, shine brightly. Be bold. Be faithful examples of good fatherhood. Uh, in your home, in your community, in your church, and in this world, because we need you. Happy Father's Day. Let's take a look at the screen now this morning, and uh, Alex and Marcy Rayhill, who have been part of our church family, uh, Alex, who is my coach, uh, is here to give us a greeting and a prayer this morning. Greetings, Uptown Church. Hi everybody, this is Alex and Marcy Rayhill greeting you from Canton, Michigan uh, in the Detroit area. We uh, miss you all terribly. We just wanted to say what a great experience it's been for us watching you from afar through Facebook and online and seeing how, all the great work that you're doing in your community and the ways that you're growing in your church. This COVID crisis has been a challenge for everybody and Uptown Church has just risen to the occasion 
caring so well for your community, keeping a bright light of Christ going, and it's exciting to watch that happen. And as you're living out the light of Christ, uh, one prayer I have for you is from Psalm 46. It's uh, a, a word for these times that we find ourselves in. It says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. And we pray that God would be demonstrating himself mighty as the refuge and strength of Uptown Church and that through that you would be experiencing the peace of the Lord and bringing the peace of the Lord in times of uncertainty mm -hmm. and anxiety. Uh, we pray that you would be a, uh, a light and a, a place that brings comfort and strength and peace from God. Lord, we pray your blessing mm -hmm. on Uptown Church. We thank you for our friends and our family in Jesus. And we pray that you would bless them and cause them, Lord, to be a light for you. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you and we miss you. God's blessings on you. Hope to see you soon. Peace. Thank you, Alex and Marcy. It's good to see you and it's good to hear from you. If this is your first time with us, we want to say welcome. We're so glad that you have joined us online this morning. We can't wait to uh, gather again uh, in person. Uh, we will be talking more about that in the coming weeks. Uh, but if you are here for the first time, would you just make yourself known in the comment section? Maybe uh, type your name, where you're watching, letting us know that it's your first time with us here uh, at Uptown Church. Uh, the other thing I would like for you to do is to follow the link that is going to be in the comment section and uh, you can see the link on the screen. Just go into a specific page on our website that allows you to put your name and email address in. That allows me personally to contact you, say hello to you, begin a relationship, and also to keep you informed with things that are happening here at Uptown Church. So uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, and then let's turn our attention back to the screen. We have a video greeting from our worship leader, David, and then we have some announcements from one of our uh, leaders, Tom. Uptown Church and happy Father's Day, dads. I want you to please take a moment and greet some people online. Hey dad, happy Father's Day. <laughs> Thank you. How's it going? <laughs> it's going good. I'm just doing some church announcements, but uh, if we could talk in just a minute. Yeah. All right. So um, please use, uh, use your like buttons, comment uh, throughout the service. Zoom groups are happening on Tuesday nights at 6.30. Please sign up in the church directory. Get involved. Uptowncov.org slash directory. Hey, happy Father's Day. Oh, yeah. hey, Joshua. How's it going? Going good. I'm just doing some church announcements. So, oh, gotcha. Uh, we'll okay. be talking a minute. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Weekly devotionals through the book of Acts are on Thursday nights at 6.30. Um, Jeremy's Zoom ID and password will be up. Join us. All right, so right after the service today, we're going to have... Uh, Post-service hey, coffee. Oh, hi, Xander. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm just doing church announcements. Can you wait one minute? Okay. Uptown Kids Zoom Group Tuesday nights at 10. 10 a.m. Just contact Kara if you want the, uh, the login info. Help donate 
and spread the word about our immigrant and refugee rental relief fund. Oh, hi, Mariah. Hey. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. I'm just doing some church announcements with Stuart here. Um, can I call you right back? Okay, I'll call you right back. You want to say hi to Uptown Church? Hi, Uptown Church. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just want to repeat. Help donate and spread the word about our immigrant and refugee rental relief fund at uptowncove.org slash rent relief. You can give your tithe or a finance. Hey, Dad. Happy hey. Father's Day. Ah, thank you. Hey, I'm just doing some church announcements. Oh. Uh, can, uh, can I just talk to you in a minute? Yeah. Okay. Last announcement. You can give your tithe or a financial gift to Uptown Church by texting a dollar amount to 84321 or through our website, uptowncub.org slash giving. Thank you, Tom, for those announcements and all of those cameos from your many, many children. Uh, we also want to announce we have some good news this morning. Uh, one of the uh, leaders here at Uptown Church is a father this week. Uh, Nathan and Brittany Cameron had their baby. So we want to introduce you this morning to Miriam Eileen Cameron, who was born on June 16th at 8.44 a.m. I'm sure uh, we're all going to be seeing um, her and uh, Nathan and Brittany um, soon. So uh, send along your wishes to them. Um, and it's so great to welcome uh, this wonderful new life. So say hello to Miriam Eileen Cameron. Uh, we also have a picture sent in from Adam and Paula Hewlett again. They keep sending them in every week because they're out on the path walking around uh, uptown and they run into people from our church. And here we have Ethan. Uh, they ran into him, so they're all saying hi. So in the comments section, would you greet uh, Adam, Paula, and Ethan? Uh, please send in your videos, your uh, pictures to, uh, to me here at Uptown Church. You can use info at uptowncub.org. We would love to show your video greeting. We would love to show your pictures of you participating in church, in your small group, uh, in the Thursday devotional. Uh, just a way for us to stay connected and feel like we're still together uh, through all of this social distancing. And then finally, uh, uh, Prisca sent in a video. Uh, I don't know if many of you know, but part of our uh, coronavirus relief effort is we've been providing uh, not just food delivery meals to people uh, that are in their homes, but we've also been bringing food to people experiencing homelessness. And uh, Prisca was able to uh, bring her neighbors along who saw what she had been doing and they wanted to come along with her. They're not a part of Uptown Church, but they went with her on one of her delivery runs and they made this video. So just take a quick look at this short video of Prisca and some friends uh, delivering some meals um, last week. As you can see, they were also able to donate some bedding uh, as well. So thank you, Prisca, and thank you for the volunteers that are helping to make this uh, happen. Thank you to everyone who is helping us uh, continue to stay faithful in our coronavirus relief efforts. I just want to give us a quick update on the Immigrant and Refugee Rental Relief Fund. We are two days away uh, from the end of the application period and the end of the donation period. So 
Uh, people have two more days to get their applications in, and we also just have a few more days here to get donations in uh, as well. I want to thank uh, Black Club Chicago and Univision for picking up the story this week uh, and getting the word out with us. In the matter of a few days, we've seen almost uh, we've seen just over $4,500 donated uh, by individuals into the uh, relief fund. We as a church are matching each one of those donations, uh, and we would love to see a couple thousand more dollars come in over the next couple of days. Yesterday was uh, World Refugee Day, and it would be great in honor of that for us to contribute, to get the word out, and to finish strong here so that we can bless uh, uh, many of our neighbors here in Uptown. Uh, there have been a lot of applications, a lot of applications coming in from outside of the Uptown area. Uh, unfortunately, we are focusing our attention on the Uptown neighborhood uh, because we know there are so many people that will be applying. Uh, I just uh, want to uh, let us know to just be in prayer and see what else can we do. There are so many people that are hurting in need in um, difficult financial positions right now because of businesses being shut down, jobs being lost. Uh, what can we do to really help and be uh, provide um, some sort of relief for people as they are hurting, as they are suffering, as they don't know how they're going to make it uh, into the next coming days, weeks, and months. Uh, next Sunday, I will be given a full report on not just the rental relief fund. We will be sort of talking about how many people we were able to bless, how much money we were able to give, but I'll also be going over the ECC grant that we were given of $10,000 and what we as a church have been doing to use that money to bless others uh, and help our community uh, during this time. Once again, uh, you can continue to give through our website or through texting. Uh, you can, uh, I just want to, I say it every week, but I am very thankful and just so grateful for your generosity, for your continued faithfulness and support uh, of Uptown Church. It just speaks a lot. Uh, to me, and I know that uh, that faithfulness is there not just out of honoring God, but also because Uptown Church is staying committed and faithful to the mission. Even though it's difficult to do the mission, uh, we are still doing it in the midst of coronavirus uh, in these days. So thank you so, so much. Last week, we started our new sermon series called Paradigm Shift, and we are going through a large section of Matthew chapter 5 together. We're to section of verses 17 through 48, and we've called it Paradigm Shift because this is a part of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount where he is confronting traditional human understanding and he's doing it with his authoritative divine enlightenment. He's making an authoritative statement over who he is, saying that he has the authority to fully interpret the law of Moses. And by doing so, Jesus disrupts the status quo of what had been widely accepted and believed about Scripture. He takes common practices, common attitudes, and common behaviors, and he calls for a paradigm shift. Last week, we studied verses 17 and through 20, and this is Jesus setting the stage for this transformative teaching because he not only identifies himself as the ultimate interpreter of Old Testament law, and this is a really bold claim for him to make, but he is putting himself, uh, he's, he's making a messianic claim here in this passage, uh, but he's also warning the listeners as an introduction into these teachings to not respond to what he says with defensiveness, self-pity, or self-righteousness. These responses are common responses to us. They really are three of the main weapons that we like to use to preserve the status quo and to avoid change. All of us have our preferred ways of thinking, living, and doing. We've all settled into ruts, routines, and patterns that work for us. I mean, they might not be perfect, but they do help us get by and survive. You know, one thing that I have always done ever since I've learned how to use Microsoft Word on a computer is when I need to paste something, cut something and paste it into another part of the document, I will highlight the text, I will copy the text with like command C, I will then press the delete button to delete the text, and then I will go to the position in the document that I need to go to and then hit command P to paste it into the text. Now, 
Many people have told me that I am taking an unnecessary step here and I know that I'm doing it because all I really need to do is use the cut command instead of the copy command. The cut command is command X. I can highlight the text, hit command X, and it will automatically copy and delete the text at the same time. And then I can move to the next place in the document that I want to and then hit command P and it will paste it right in. So my, per, my way of doing it, my routine, my rut, what I think is normal, what I've learned and I've never really adopted is I have an extra step in there. And people have tried to tell me, Jeremy, that's unnecessary. You don't have to do that. You can do it this way. It's easier and it's better. When others critique, push back, or try to change what we've adopted as normal behavior, we tend to either get combative, we can have a meltdown, or we become indignant. We respond with either defensiveness, self-pity, or self-righteousness. On the screen this morning, you will find three prayers connected to these um, uh, areas. Which one of the prayers on the screen do you need to pray most this morning? When it comes to the shifting and the transformation and the change that God wants to do in our lives, do we tend to get combative? Do we tend to fall into self-pity? Or do we tend to move into self-righteousness? I want us to take a moment and just look at these different prayers. Lord, instead of my normal defensiveness, help me to respond with curiosity and open heart and listening ears. Lord, instead of my normal self-pity, give me mental strength to respond with optimism, gratitude, and selflessness. Lord, instead of my normal self-righteousness, help me to respond with humility, repentance, and a teachable spirit. As we are about to enter into Jesus' teachings, let's take a moment and let's, in a moment of confession and in a moment of preparation, let's use the comment section to maybe type and print our prayer. Which one of these three hits home the most with us right now in the moment that we find ourselves in? Go ahead, take a moment, focus on the screen, and let's prepare and confess and get ready to encounter the teachings of Jesus. Jesus says six times now in the passage we are starting to go through, you've heard, but I say. You've always thought, but here's what you should really think. You've always believed, but now let me tell you what's really true. You've always behaved, now I want to tell you how to really live. How will we respond in the paradigm shift? R.T. France describes the paradigm shift teachings of Jesus as radical ethics. I love this term. Uh, Jesus is taking ethical norms and then he expands on them in ways that make them actually more demanding with greater implications that are far more reaching and, than what was widely accepted at the time. And Jesus' first teaching, which we're going to look at today, is addressing one of the most famous of the Ten Commandments that we all know, which is, Thou shalt not kill. And I'm using the King James Version to say it, because that's how we've always learned it, Thou shalt not kill. R.T. France, to quote him, says, Jesus, in this passage, goes behind the act of murder itself to declare that the anger and the hatred which give rise to it though not capable of being examined in a human court, are no less culpable in the sight of God. So let's read Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 26. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, 
and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. In our passage this morning, we see that Jesus' radical ethic doesn't just prohibit murder, but anger in the form of contempt. In verse 22, we find this when Jesus says, But I tell you, so here's the new paradigm shifting teaching, I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Now let's be clear. Anger is not a sin. Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger, do not sin. This implies that it is possible to be angry and not sin. But it's also possible to be angry and sin. And this is what Jesus is addressing here. And Jesus is addressing an anger that is rooted in contempt for another person. You see, murder is an extreme form of contempt. Our holding on to our disdain, disregard, and scorn for another person can lead to us murdering them. But it usually doesn't result in this end. Jesus ushers in a paradigm shift for those of us who haven't murdered anybody in a while. And he says that if we insult others with contempt, using terms like fool, idiot, or airhead, which is like a good uh, definition of raka, that these things put us in danger of the same judgment, in danger of the fires of hell, because these things too God is not pleased with, and he actually despises the insulting anger of contempt. R.T. France, again, to quote him, says, The deliberate paradox of Jesus' pronouncement is that ordinary insults may betray an attitude of contempt which God takes extremely seriously. While this extreme form of contempt, murder, was unacceptable in society then, and it's unacceptable now, these more subtle forms of contempt continue to be commonplace in our society and widely acceptable, even within the church. And Jesus is addressing our self-righteousness direct and head-on. Are we listening and how are we responding? Now, righteous, justified anger isn't an anger that's dismissive, that, that's dismissive or filled with disdain. Righteous, justified anger is actually something that rises up in response to contempt, in response to injustice. It is in many of the hearts and the voices that we see and hear declaring that black lives matter, black lives have worth, and black lives are valuable. It isn't a sinful anger because it's an anger that's crying for respect, demanding dignity and worth. It's an anger that's resisting the widespread attitudes of contempt resisting the widespread acts of murder that are happening in this country. What kind of anger is in us this morning? Do we possess an anger of concern, or do we possess an anger of contempt? Do you know a hotbed for anger of contempt is our families? It's possible in our marriage, it's easy in our marriages, our uh, with our kids, with our parents, with our siblings, to have contempt become part of our anger. Now, conflict is going to happen. We're going to fight. We're going to disagree. We're going to engage uh, uh, in some sort of disputes with one another. But do we engage with contempt for one another? It's possible that things can happen and build up over time and things can happen in, in relationships to where anger isn't dealt with and moved on from, but it's actually handled in a sinful way, and it comes out with contempt to one another. Leadership dynamics are a hotbed for anger of contempt. The way leaders feel towards people that are uh, working for them or following them, or the way that workers or followers feel towards their leaders. We see this dynamic in Numbers chapter 20, when the people 
complained against Moses, against his leadership, uh, and they resented him and had contempt for him, and he responded back with contempt for them, and he strikes the rock instead of following what God's command was for him to speak to the rock, and this contempt that Moses held in his heart for the people is what prohibited him from entering the promised land. And then finally, politics is a major hotbed for the anger of contempt today. I don't care which side you're on, contempt is flowing everywhere. There is a distinct culture of smugness that permeates our political culture. Jesus has specific teachings for us here this morning that tell us as Christians how we are to operate in this world. And he says that we should not be operating with the anger of contempt. So when we look at how we are with our families, when we look at how we are with leadership, when we look at how we are in the political world, when we look at how we are and how we uh, uh, um, operate and live, Do we operate with a righteous, justified anger, an anger of concern, or are we operating sinfully? When our souls are not being constantly nourished in prayer and in the Word of God, it is easy for our anger to cause us to sin. John Newton writes, Whatever it be that makes us trust in ourselves, that we are comparatively wise or good, so as to treat those with contempt who do not subscribe to our doctrines or follow our party is a proof and fruit of a self-righteous spirit. Another way to describe contempt, it is anger without compassion. Secondly, Jesus' radical ethic is not just prohibiting murder, but it prohibits anger in the form of grudges. In verse 23 and 24, Jesus continues on with his paradigm shift teaching when he says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So Jesus' teaching not only draws our attention to our sinful contempt, but to our sinful grudges. Contempt usually works on the front end of our anger. It can easily and quickly manifest itself as we become angry and we lash out with contempt. But grudges, those usually settle in a little bit further down the road in our anger as we hold on to it and as we cling to it. This is more evidence that although anger is not sinful, I reiterate again that although anger is not sinful, it is dangerous. James tells us to be wise and to be slow to our anger. It is so easy for us to fall into the trap of contempt or the pit of persistent resentment if we do not handle and manage our anger biblically and properly. Ephesians 4.26 again mirrors Jesus' teaching here on the Sermon on the Mount because it not only states to not uh, sin in our anger, the second part of the verse says to not let the sun go down on our anger. So now we see grudges part of that teaching from Paul as well. Jesus commands us to be a people of reconciliation and restoration to avoid the pitfall of grudges. Reconciliation in human relationships matters deeply to Jesus. In alignment with the Old Testament, he's pointing out the futility of our worship attempts when we choose to neglect the matters of obedience that he is asking us to do. We see this in Isaiah 1, Jeremiah 7, Amos 5, Micah 6, Psalm 24, just to name a few. 1 Samuel 15, uh, the prophet says, Samuel says, God desires obedience more than sacrifice. And now Jesus here does not lay out a path for us to end our grudges by trying to figure out who did what, who initiated things, or who instigated the hurt. David Turner writes about this passage, this verse. He writes, It is not a question of arguing about who offended whom, but of taking responsibility and initiating reconciliation. 
So instead of focusing on fault finding, Jesus is actually looking and focusing on our initiative and our openness to reconciliation. Are we avoiding the process or are we engaging in it? That's what Jesus is concerned with. When I'm holding a grudge, I don't like to hear this. Because when I have a grudge, I want to be focused on fault finding. I want to be paying attention to who is to blame. So I don't like to hear Jesus' teaching here because Jesus is focusing on reconciliation and restoration happening. Why? Because my grudge is usually rooted in my holding on to feelings of being hurt, mistreated, or dismissed by somebody. And I want Jesus to be concerned about who threw the first stone the way I'm concerned about who threw the first stone. But Jesus comes to me and says, Jeremy, I'm looking at your heart to see if you are open to relationship repair. And what attempts are you making and what openness do you have to that end? You see, the last thing I want to do when I've been hurt is come to the table of reconciliation. My sinful nature wants to run, put up walls, and avoid the work of vulnerability here. But Jesus doesn't give me an out. And so church, for all of us here this morning, even when we feel that we have been wronged, we are commanded by Jesus to stop, to lay our worship aside of him for a second, and to go and pursue reconciliation. And thankfully, this is so key here. The Bible gives us guidance for how to be reconciled to God and how to be reconciled to one another. Thank God for the good news of Scripture because it is tempting for us to create our own comfortable, desired course to work through these matters. But we are not to follow what we want to do. We must follow the leading of God's Word as believers. When we make our own demands and when we lay out our own personal agenda for what we think reconciliation should look like, we actually become a roadblock to the process. God is the expert at reconciliation, which means we can follow his lead and his advice when it comes to how to be reconciled to him and how to be reconciled to one another. Matthew 18, uh, 15 through 17, Colossians 1, 20 through 22, Colossians 3, 13, Ephesians 4, 32, Hebrews 12, 14, Luke 23, 24, when Jesus is on the cross, Romans 5, uh, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. These are all passages that revolve and deal with reconciliation. Are we holding grudges this morning? God's best for us doesn't involve living with a permeating resentment that's bubbling below the surface in our hearts, always there, always festering. No, God wants us to be set free. Are we ready to stop avoiding? And are we ready to stop hindering the process of reconciliation? Reconciliation is not an easy process. It's not a false, fake unity that happens. But no, it is a deep, long work at times that involves confession, it involves repentance, it involves humility, it involves brokenness. So I want to, uh, once again, just um, iterate how uh, not to make light of the process of reconciliation, but point us to Scripture for how we should engage in that process. Finally, Jesus' radical ethic doesn't just prohibit murder, but anger in the form of disputes. Verse 25 through 26, the last part of our passage, Jesus says to settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still on the way together, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Grudges tend to form in our close relationships, but disputes of anger tend to manifest itself in our daily interactions where there seems to be little or a lack of relationship with people. And Jesus now concludes this paradigm-shifting teaching with a final note that the sixth commandment, which we all know, has also implications for how we are to handle ourselves in conflicts outside of the church and outside of our close relationships. 
In Jesus' illustration, he's pointing to two people, a generic civil dispute that has erupted, and they're going through the court system together. Jesus' radical ethic on anger is not only prohibiting murder, it's not only prohibiting contempt, it's not only prohibiting grudges, it now speaks into how we as Christians should handle conflict when it arises in business and in life. If we are an employer, how do we treat and interact with our employees and our customers? How do we resolve problems that arise? If we are patrons, how do we treat those who are trying to help us and assist us, especially when we are not satisfied with our experience? If we are landlords, what type of landlord are we to our renters? If we are tenants, what, how do we treat the property that we are living in? What happens? How do we respond when we get cut off in traffic? What happens when a car is blocking the bike lane? What is, is it that we do to respond to our annoying neighbor. Disputes are never in short supply, are they? They're everywhere. How do we handle them? How does our anger reveal itself when we find ourselves in these problem areas? Kara and I have worked many, many years in customer service, and boy, have we seen tons of disputes and been part of tons of disputes. I'm sure I don't have to uh, say this in a way that reveals uh, something new to us, but people truly can be mean, cruel, and blow up at any time over any little thing. I am sure many of you have stories to share about crazy disputes that have broken out over the tiniest of things. Someone that has blown up at us, we have blown up at them, or we have seen two people blow up at each other. When I moved uh, to Ann Arbor, Michigan, we purchased a house and we had a really long, beautiful backyard. And our backyard uh, was so long and narrow that on the left side of our backyard, we actually had three houses in a row with their backyards backing up onto our backyard. So if you can imagine that, uh, our house having a really long backyard, and then on the left side, there's three backyards in a row backing up to our property. And as soon as we moved in and we loved that backyard, we had a walnut tree back there, there was raspberry bushes, I mean, it was, it, was, it was beautiful. And one day, within a few weeks of living there, I look out the back window of my house and I see about 12 cars parked in my backyard on like the back third uh, of the backyard. And I'm like, why are there 12 cars in my backyard? So I go out and I walk through my backyard and I get to the last house with its backyard backing up to mine, and they're having a party. And a bunch of people had come over to their house and they were parking all of their cars in my yard. And I went up to the owner of the house, I had never met him before, and I was like, you know, like you, you, you have all your cars parked in my backyard. And he was just really dismissive and was like, oh yeah, I've always done this. Anyone that's ever lived there uh, just lets me, you know, do that. I, I sort of keep this area mowed. And, and I said, well, you know, I, I live here now. We haven't even talked about this. and. I don't, I don't think you should be parking your cars in my backyard. And all of a sudden, it just turned into a, a dispute where he got so angry with me. He's like, I have every right to do this. I've lived here for 25 years. You've not lived, you know, and it just started, it just blew up. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I said, I tried to keep it as calm as possible. I'm like, I, I understand that, but I would rather prefer that you didn't. I don't want cars in the, I mean, I want to be able to preserve the grass. Like, wh whatever happened, but the dispute just, just broke right. out. Don't you? As Christians, Jesus calls us to pay attention to how we engage in everyday life, in everyday disputes. We are still called to operate with radical reconciliation in all of these matters and in all of these ways. As we get ready to close this morning, how are we doing? Taking us back to our earlier questions that we encountered in the introduction, are we paying attention to our defensiveness, our self-pity, and our self-righteousness as Jesus leads us into this paradigm shift teaching on murder where we maybe have felt we're doing pretty good in this area and now Jesus comes in and says, oh yeah, my authoritative divine interpretation of this sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, also includes contempt, grudges, and daily disputes. 
What is happening to us as we hear Jesus teaching us? My prayer is that we're hearing the word of the Lord and we're responding with curiosity, open hearts, and listening ears. That we have a sense of optimism and gratitude in us even as we hear the teachings of Jesus. And that we desire to respond with humility, confession, and repentance in this moment. You see, when we first come to Christ, there is an initial flurry of shifting that happens in us. We've come to the end of ourselves. We recognize a need for God, for change. So in humility and desperation, we surrender to God and we ask him for his help to change the way we think, to change the way we feel, behave, live. We want to do things differently. That is sort of the core as to what we are feeling and experiencing when we come to God for salvation. We each have a testimony of how our lives were going one direction before God. And then we had a major paradigm shift. God rescued us from that trajectory, from that path. And he shifted us into a new way of living and being. He also transformed who we are. This morning, you might not identify as a Christian. You might be here watching part of our church service because you're spiritually curious. You're looking for hope, or maybe you're just attending because a friend invited you to be here this morning. Well, I'm here to tell you that God wants to bless you with new life, and God wants to offer you the greatest paradigm shift you can experience. He wants to rearrange your heart and your mind, and he wants you to experience the gift of salvation and acceptance if you are willing to surrender to him this morning. God not only wants to help navigate our anger and hatred that I've talked about today. He wants to transform our entire lives in a wonderful way. Are you open to that paradigm shift today? And for the many Christians that are here this morning, God is not done with his transformative process in us. He isn't finished with you and he isn't finished with me. There's still some major shifting that needs to happen in us. There are idols that need to be torn down in our lives. There are protected areas in our heart that need the fencing to be ripped out. There are addictions in us that need to be broken. There are generational life patterns that need to be uprooted. And as 2 Corinthians 10.5 states, there are attitudes, thoughts, and beliefs in all of us that need to be demolished so that our hearts and our minds can be fully captivated with obedience to Christ. This morning, fellow Christian believer, are you open to God shifting you away from contempt, shifting you away from grudges, and shifting you away from an improper handling of daily disputes. As we conclude and as we close, I want to offer us time in the comments to confess and to name those things. So for those of you that are spiritually searching and those of you that have not turned your life over to Christ yet, would you uh, have the courage to Put that into the comments so our leaders can reach out to you and we can pray a prayer of confession for salvation uh, uh, for you. And for those that are believers, would you be willing to confess, whether it be uh, contempt, whether it be grudges, or whether it be daily dispute, to take time to name that and to say a quick prayer or to type a short prayer asking God to, de to deliver, to transform, and to shift us. Let's take a moment and do that right now.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for sending your son Jesus to teach us how to understand and know your word. Lord, we admit that we struggle with our anger. We admit that we are quick to contempt. We treasure and hold on to our grudges. And we don't always respond well in our daily disputes. Lord, we need your help. Lord, would you help each of us here in this moment? Lord, and for those that are making a commitment to you for the first time, who are coming to you for a full paradigm shift, for full transformation, because they are fed up and done with the way that they have been living. They found it to be hopeless. They found it to be empty and hollow. And Lord, they now want to turn to you. Would you transform them and change them according to the promise that you have laid out for us? Lord, let us not walk away from this moment the same, but let us all be changed and let us all be different. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you now join me in our closing worship song uh, with, with uh, Sarah Gioi? So we're actually having some technical difficulties on our end. You might be able to hear it there, but we're not able to hear it here, so we can't uh, do what we need to do. So we're going to have to come back to it. Sorry, Sarah. Um, we would love to hear your song uh, and to be able to um, uh, worship with you. But uh, let's go ahead. Uh, uh, Prisca was supposed to be doing our benediction, but we're not going to be able to do that as well. So let's just recite our benediction together. The words should be able to come up onto the screen still. Lord, give me opportunities this week to help disrupt suffering and mend what is broken with the hope of Jesus. Where there is violence, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is poverty, help me to offer the resources I have. Where there is addiction, may I pray for the power of your freedom. Where there is loneliness, use me to foster community. Where there is an overabundance of convenience, teach me to sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here with us. Once again, we say happy Father's Day to all of the dads out there. Uh, in about five minutes, we will be on Zoom together to uh, engage in a post-service uh, hangout time. Uh, bring your coffee, bring uh, yourself just as you are. Uh, we can share a little bit about what God's been speaking to us through the uh, service today. And then we can also check in with each other and see how one another's been doing through the week. 
Uh, it's just a wonderful way to combat loneliness and isolation and to just still feel connected as a church family together. So once again, we thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for being here, and we'll see you on Zoom in about five minutes.